Good morning. Welcome to, uh, to Bible study this morning. We're going to be talking about the story of the Emmaus disciples in Luke chapter 24. That's the, the gospel lesson for this third Sunday of Easter in the lectionary that we follow here at King of Grace. So uh, those are the verses we're going to be looking at. I'll have um, some of them up on the screen as we go along. We'll follow a format similar to last week. But um, if you want to have your own Bible open to the side, you can see all the text at once. That's where we are, Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. And this is the last chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. Uh, there are just a couple of stories in this chapter, uh, the empty tomb, and then that story ends with, in verse 12, Peter wondering what this might mean, right? And then this story of the Emmaus disciples is two guys walking down the road wondering what this might mean, and Jesus explains it to them. And then he is revealed to them uh, in a meal. They run back to Jerusalem. Jesus appears again. These same two disciples are, uh, are there still for that meeting. Jesus appears uh, behind the locked doors, um, proves to them he is alive by eating a meal, and then explains to them what all of this means. And then the ascension just in a few verses at the end of the, at the, end of the chapter. Now, St. Luke uh, wrote two books of the New Testament, um, and by word count, it's almost a third of the New Testament that St. Luke wrote. Uh, only two books. Paul wrote uh, many letters, but they're shorter. Uh, and so Luke's a major New Testament author, and his gospel is part one, and the book of Acts is part two. And so this is the last chapter in the gospel, and, and it prepares us to get into then uh, the book of Acts, the growth of the New Testament church uh, in the beginning, the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and, and those who are in that uh, early church. So that's what's happening right here in the last chapter of Luke's gospel. Now on the second Sunday of Easter last week, we read the story about doubting Thomas. This is actually chronologically prior to that. Uh, or these two Sundays don't come in chronological order, but are reversed. So the story of doubting Thomas is only in John's gospel. And it begins on Easter evening when Jesus appears between lock, behind locked doors. But then most of the story happens a week later when Thomas is with them. This one uh, is happening on Easter afternoon. And uh, the story about the Emmaus, the, or the disciples walking to Emmaus, uh, the Emmaus disciples, is uh, unique to Luke's gospel. He's the only one who tells about this story. When he tells about the locked upper room, he doesn't include Thomas. Uh, John had included that because that's the story that talks about the proof of the resurrection. Touch me. See that I'm real. Well, Luke accomplishes that same thing in his story by um, indicating that Jesus ate some fish with the disciples in that room. So uh, he's already accomplished the proof of the resurrection. Um, he's not including his great commission here like John did with that story because Luke has got another book to write because he's going to write about Acts and he'll include that. Uh, in, in Acts at the Ascension story when Jesus tells his disciples to go and be missionaries. So that's where we are. Uh, that's the surrounding story here of Luke chapter 24. And like we did last week, we're going to uh, take a look at the story on the basis of narrative, just on the basis of how the story works. And so last time we just looked at these couple of steps. These are common steps for a narrative. Uh, across all cultures and stories and formats of storytelling, uh, movies and novels and everything else. Uh, these are all just common things. And so we're going to look through these six steps, um, just like we did last week for, for Doubting Thomas. So here for the Emmaus disciples, uh, the ordinary life, the way that the story kicks off, is here in verses 13 and 14. Uh, on that same day, that means Easter Sunday, Two of the disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. Okay, easy. That's just a description of normal life, uh, how this story kicks off. But something then happens to shake up the action. And that is um, here in the next verse. While they were talking, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. Okay, so now this gets the story rolling get something started. Uh, this is what shakes everything up, because if Jesus hadn't appeared, they would have just continued walking the rest of the story and talking about what had happened. Um, but Jesus is the new element to their story here. Now, on the way, there has to be some problems to overcome in order to make a story interesting. 
and we get one right off the bat. Here's a problem. These disciples are not able to recognize who Jesus is. That's a curious thing. We have questions about that. I'm going to come back to talk about maybe why that's the case. Uh, we'll come back to that. But for right now, we're just going to recognize that uh, this is one of the problems along the way. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So that gets us um, verse 16. But then all of the uh, dialogue that the, that the disciples give is part of that rising tension. Um, they, they tell Jesus what they're talking about. Jesus says what things, and then they give the whole long explanation uh, about what had happened. That's really a summary of everything that had happened in Holy Week. Um, it really kind of goes back to, through the whole gospel. Uh, we thought Jesus was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. That's really a way to summarize all 21 chapters of Luke up until Holy Week. And so uh, that's all part of the rising tension, part of the problems that they're going to overcome. Okay, then you got to get to the climax. The climax is the point after which nothing can be the same. Everything has to be different. They have to fall off of the climax, if you think about it like a mountain peak, the top. Uh, they have to fall off one side or the other. They can either accomplish their call to adventure uh, or they can fail. And so the climax here is when Jesus replies to them. And he says, how foolish and slow of heart you are to believe. Did not Christ have to suffer all of these things? And then he explained to them what was said in scripture. And uh, so this is our question then. The climax and the resolution is always the point of the story. Uh, will the disciples continue to be foolish and slow of heart? Or will they understand after Jesus explains to them? They have to fall off this mountaintop, this climax, one way or the other. Will they continue to be foolish or will they understand? Now, often, of course, this climax and resolution is the intended point for us, the readers, as well. And so that question then naturally becomes the question we ask ourselves after Jesus has explained these things, or another teacher uh, in our life, will we fall off of the side that remains foolish and slow of heart to believe, or will we finally understand and recognize Jesus? And so that's the point here for us um, as well. Um, so then the resolution uh, is this explanation. Uh, and these two portions, like I just said, are, are the um, point of the story. Uh, the resolution uh, after Jesus says foolish and slow of heart is that he explains everything and then they should, uh, they should understand. And this is what the author then wants for us, the reader as well. But these disciples got a detailed explanation of Moses and all the prophets from Jesus, right? That's incredible. And they're walking seven miles. Um, Jesus probably appeared near the beginning of the journey and he went all the way to the end. How long does it take to walk seven miles? Um, generally, uh, a person strolls at around three miles an hour, uh, but there's some hilly terrain here as they leave Jerusalem, they're going down some mountains and things, so their, their pace may be slower. Uh, they reach Emmaus at the end of the day, and we don't know what time they left Jerusalem, but let's say that this takes um, maybe four or five hours for this walk. So that means that Jesus has got four hours to explain in detail everything that was said in the scriptures concerning himself. That's an incredible teaching. And we don't get that, do we? We really would love to see, what did Jesus say for four hours? What, what's this content of his teaching? Uh, but it's not given to us here, which I find pretty interesting. Um, and so we have to go examine Moses and the scriptures for ourselves. And that's the Christian journey. Now we're going to make the literal journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus into a, a, um, a spiritualized, uh, figurative one. We're on a journey, and we've got the whole way to examine what Moses and the scriptures say. For them, it was only four hours, and so Jesus accelerated their understanding um, by just laying it out for them. But for many of us, it's years and years and decades. And so we don't get the fast version. Uh, we've got to go examine Moses and the prophets for ourselves. Now, uh, there are um, some more problems happening, and we're going to talk about how it seems like there might be two climaxes and resolutions, and we'll talk about that here. But um, another problem now is going to happen, uh, sort of some more rising tension, if you want to back up a little bit. Jesus acted as if he was going farther, um, but they urged him to stay with us. So that's a problem. 
Uh, and we still have the unresolved problem of their, uh, un of their being unable to recognize him. And so at the meal then, when he blessed, blessed the bread and gave it to them, then their eyes were opened and they recognized who he was. So there's another climax there that Jesus is breaking the bread. And now you have to go one way or the other. Are you going to recognize Jesus or not? Uh, and then they do recognize him. And so you can also ask, are, are we going to recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread uh, in the Lord's Supper? Um, and so that's another climax. Uh, it comes later in the story. And so some interpreters may want to claim that this is the higher climax because it comes later. It's hard to have some uh, more rising tension than another climax after the main point has already been said. And so that's a valid interpretation as well. Um, but here's why I think the earlier one is the main point. The story is written as what's called a chiasm. That's a, a, a style, a technique of literary uh, writing. And so here the rising tension was that Jesus was not recognized by them in person. Their eyes were kept for recognizing him. And then they, weren't rec they didn't recognize him in scripture. Um, and then the resolution is that he revealed himself in scripture and then revealed himself in person. And so you can see how it works from the outside in. Uh, and when you have a chiasm as a structure, it's the inside, the center, that's what's highlighted. And so then that becomes the higher point. And so in my reading of this story, uh, I think the, the greater point is that Jesus is recognized in scripture. Uh, that's further supported, I think, by our common sense. Uh, Luke, the author, intends something for us, the readers. He wants something for us. Does he want us to recognize Jesus in person? Well, it is maybe not possible. We don't see Jesus in person. Now we can, by analogy and stretching that out just a little bit, talk about the Lord's Supper. Um, but I don't think Luke's point is the Lord's Supper in this story. The point is recognizing Jesus from scripture. And that's what we find in the center. And so that's why I will um, understand this story to have that as the, the, the major climax. Now, neither of these climaxes are in conflict with each other. They really are saying the same thing, aren't they? We recognize Jesus only by revelation. That's what both are saying. It, it requires Moses and the prophets to see Jesus in the story of history. And it requires Jesus revealing himself to us in the bread as well by faith. And so the, the two climaxes aren't really in conflict. They really do end up saying the same thing. And then we've got the, uh, the new normal, of course. What happens afterwards? How do these characters respond? Um, now, after they have come to this resolution and they get up, they return to Jerusalem, they describe what had happened along the road and how they recognized him. Uh, the new normal is the personal testimony of these disciples. Now, sometimes we get, sometimes as Lutherans, we can get a little uncomfortable about personal testimony uh, because we value scripture so highly and we want faith to come through hearing the word. Uh, but the word of Christians are also part of God, the way that God works. Now, he uses our own words to draw people into his word. Um, but you have to realize that the words of the Bible are also human words. Now, they're inspired, uh, and that puts them on a different level than our own words. But our personal testimony is uh, an important factor in our mission to make disciples. And, um, and so that's what these disciples are doing. We see that in their example here. They're going and simply telling what had happened to them. Uh, and we should do that as well. We should tell what has happened to us, how we recognize Jesus in our own lives and things as well. Okay, so I'll stop right there. Uh, that's a quick overview of the literary structure of this text um, and how it's all put together, what I think is the main point. Uh, you can ask some questions either by raising your hand. You can find that participants button on the bottom of your screen. If you're using a mobile device, you'll just have to tap the center of the screen once if you're not seeing any buttons. You'll find the participants and then you can raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, you can chat here and then I'll um, uh, either read your question or put you up on the screen and you can ask. So it's okay if you don't have any questions. You don't have to bail me out here, but it's just your opportunity. So I'll pause here for just a second. Okay, nobody jumped on the opportunity. Uh, so it's uh, clear as mud for everybody, I'm sure, right? Yeah. 
Uh, but we'll have a, another chance here at the end also to ask some questions and things as well. So here we go with some of the other uh, some of the other details here. Now, the biggest curiosity in this narrative is that their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. Why is that? Why uh, why did Jesus do that to them? You know, uh, if his point is to expand their understanding, to reveal himself, then he seems to be working at odds with his own purpose, that he would stop them from recognizing him. My own explanation of that, uh, and this is only a guess, uh, my own explanation is that because the point was to see Jesus in scripture, if they had recognized him as soon as he walked up to them on the road, they never would have gotten to scripture. It, he would have defeated his own purpose. Um, they would have been so excited to have seen their uh, risen uh, Lord, their Redeemer, the guy they thought was going to defeat the Romans, that they wouldn't really have focused on, on what the death and resurrection actually means from Scripture, a redemption from sin, death, and the devil, rather than a redemption from the Romans. Uh, and so their minds would have been locked right back on that track that they saw Jesus alive again. And so uh, I think that recognizing him would have distracted them from their needed education. Uh, you should also notice that Jesus never intended their lack of recognition, their state of blindness to be permanent. He wanted them to recognize him, obviously because he did it for them at the end, um, but he waited until the right time. So that's just my guess about um, why perhaps their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Um, in verse 17, uh, Jesus said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? And this is our EHV translation. It says saddened, they stopped. The NIV puts those phrases the other way. They stopped, saddened, um, or downcast. And the Greek, uh, I think it's a wonderful sentence structure here. I just wanted to point it out. Uh, walk along is a single word, and stopped is a single word. And they're right next to each other in Greek. So they stopped comes before the word saddened. Uh, so I think it's just a, a beautiful picture. Uh, what are you talking about as, as you walk along? They stopped. Uh, saddened in order to talk with each other. So they couldn't continue on, on the journey while, while they were in this emotional uh, state. Um, you know, we can say a few things about that uh, for ourselves as well, that we often come across conditions in which we have a, a very big emotional impact. And perhaps the journey stops momentarily and we stand still. And Jesus comes to us then as well. And so we can find some comfort in that. But it was just a nice... Um, uh, writing, brilliant writing. Now, Luke is a physician by training. We know that from, uh, from the Bible itself, um, but he's a good writer too. And that was just an example of his literary skill. Okay. Um, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened? So that indicates that we have to be near the Jerusalem end of the journey when Jesus joins them. Seven miles uh, between the two cities and let's say they had been five miles along on the journey. Now they're walking through the countryside. They've passed other towns along the way. And if this guy were to walk up to them on the road and then said, what are they talking about? And, they, and he said, I don't know what's going on in Jerusalem. They would have said, oh, well, you're from the country. You weren't there. You didn't hear about all of this. So I think that just probably indicates that Jesus had to be on the end of the journey closer to Jerusalem, uh, that they obviously thought he had been there. Uh, to have, have been, been there over the weekend and to have heard these things. Um, then they say a man who was a prophet. Uh, so that's what they think about Jesus, a man who was a prophet. Now it becomes ironic, of course, that Jesus explains to them from the prophets uh, what was said about him. Um, but is that all Jesus is, a prophet? Shouldn't they have recognized him as the Messiah? And so you see that they've got a problem in understanding who Jesus is. They think he's a redeemer from the Romans. They think he's a prophet. They haven't gotten to the point yet of seeing him as Messiah. And they need to do that before they can see him uh, risen again on Easter. Uh, redeem Israel. That's that point about um, a redeemer from the Romans. Now, we often hear this about the disciples, uh, the 12, but also about the broader group of disciples as well, uh, that they're waiting for a political redeemer, somebody to save them from the Romans. Uh, that was their current spirit, uh, their current oppressor. And um, it's a misunderstanding, of course, uh, but a common one at the time. And so we think, oh, these disciples, they didn't get it. They didn't know what was going on. Well, we've had a lot of time and education to think about these things. Um, but it was totally no, uh, expected for them 
to think about this Redeemer from the Romans, uh, particularly Isaiah's prophecies about the Redeemer, the Messiah. Uh, and there's two pictures that Isaiah uses about the Messiah. One is that he is um, a liberator, um, a victor uh, that frees the Israelites just as God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. But the other that Isaiah uses is the suffering servant, that this Messiah uh, was going to die. Uh, by his stripes we are healed. Uh, that's an Isaiah uh, quote. And um, by this point, um, the disciples and the Jews mostly had just focused on the glorious Messiah rather than the suffering one. Uh, and so they had forgotten that other part. So redeem Israel there with us. Um, let's see. Then we get down to um, some of our group. Uh, some women of our group amazed us. This tells us that these two disciples are pretty close. They're not part of the 12, uh, but they're pretty close that the women are part of their group. And then some of those who were with us went to the tomb. That's Peter and John. We learned from other um, gospels. And, uh, and so these guys are pretty close. The following story has them in the room when Jesus appears behind locked doors. Uh, with the, uh, the rest of the apostles. So these guys should have known what Jesus was talking about. Um, if you watch the sermon already, that's what I'm talking about. These disciples had heard already from Jesus that uh, this is what was going to happen and this is what things had mean. He had told the disciples that week. Um, so they should have known better. Um, Jesus said to them, how foolish and slow of heart uh, to believe. Now, let's see. Sounds harsh. Uh, again, this is what I'm going to deal with uh, in the sermon. If you haven't watched that yet, that's, I'm going to spend some time talking about that. Uh, but it's a surprise for us to hear our patient Jesus uh, speak that way to his disciples. We're not really surprised to have him explain things. Yeah, that's what teacher Jesus does. Uh, but to lead off by saying, boy, you guys just don't know what's going on uh, is a surprise. They had claimed that Jesus was a prophet, but then were slow to believe what the prophets had said. You know, they didn't understand it. So um, then he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Uh, now, sometimes there's a debate among pastors and sermon writers and preachers um, and, and, and among other Christians as well. Does every verse of the Bible say something about Jesus? Um, you know, uh, from anything from, from, from the Old Testament. Um, does every verse say something about Jesus? Um, and then a verse like this would be used in support of that. Now, that's not actually what Jesus says right here. He doesn't say that every scripture verse was concerning him. He said that in the scriptures, some things were said concerning him. Uh, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures, not that all the scriptures were said concerning him. So it's just a little bit different there. Um, so it's not, it's not that Jesus said everything in scripture was specifically about him. Uh, directly at the first level. But Jesus is the center point of God's revelation. And so we can say that all of the scriptures are about Jesus. They all prepare us for him in some way or tell us about him in some way. Some of those very direct, some of those by implication, uh, some of those by poetry, some of those by story, some of those verses in other ways. But uh, all scripture does point to Jesus as the center point of history and as the point of revelation. Uh, and so there's no verse of scripture that doesn't relate to Jesus in that it's not, um, it's not getting us ready for him. And it's always good for us to be reminded of Jesus in everything that we see in life, whether that's a verse of scripture or it's the flowers outside or it's a sandwich that you're making. Uh, it's good for us to be reminded of Jesus in always, all the time, as much as we can have um, Jesus on our minds. Uh, as they approached the village, Jesus acted as if he were going to travel farther. Now, sometimes people will jump on that and they'll say, hmm, was Jesus lying to them? Uh, he intended them to think something that wasn't true. He acted as if he was going. No, it's clearly Jesus is not lying to anybody. Uh, but this is a test, isn't it? Um, Jesus was testing them and God frequently tests his people. That's hardly a new idea in scripture. And so this is the way that Jesus does it here as well. Acted as if you were going to travel farther. Think about Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Uh, that story is introduced to us. The first verse of that story specifically says God tested Abraham saying to him. Um, and that's all kind of an act then too, isn't it? 
God uh, acted as if Abraham should sacrifice Isaac. Uh, but we don't claim that God was lying to Abraham in that verse. Uh, so Jesus is not lying. Uh, he's simply testing these disciples. Uh, he acted as if he were going to travel farther. Now remember, I, I think that probably he was there the whole, the whole trip for them. Uh, and so Jesus had waited the whole journey. This means he's at the end before this is happening. So Jesus has waited the whole journey in, before he revealed himself uh, at the end. Uh, the disciples say, stay with us since it is almost evening and the day is almost over. Um, wonderful verse, many devotions and sermons written, uh, urging believers to ask Jesus to, say, to stay with them today. Uh, and so lots of, lots of literature written about, about that verse and, um, and well-deserved. Uh, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began giving it to them. Now, is this the Lord's Supper specifically? That's not what Luke says. Uh, certainly it reminds us of it, absolutely, and I think Luke intends for us to be reminded of it, um, but he doesn't say that this is the Lord's Supper. So whether or not Jesus actually spoke his own words of institution at this meal, uh, we don't have any other records of Jesus um, uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper after the first time. This, this would be the only case that would make it exceptional. Uh, and so we don't know that Jesus once again said the words, uh, and I, I tend to think not. Uh, but Luke is certainly intending for us to think about the Lord's Supper just by the phrasing that he uses here. Um, the inspiration here isn't in what Jesus did, which is not recorded. The inspiration is in what Luke wrote. And uh, I think Luke intends for us to recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread. And St. Paul dwells on that as well. Uh, then Jesus vanished from their sight. Uh, one wonderful irony, of course that this whole day they've been walking with Jesus, not knowing who he was. Then the moment they recognize him, he's gone. And uh, certainly um, ironic uh, that way, I think. Um, now, this also indicates Jesus' uh, physical presence after the resurrection. Um, in the narrative that follows, Jesus stands, uh, stands with them in the locked room and he eats some fish. Um, and we don't know quite how all of this works that Jesus in his omnipresence is able to have a physical body that vanishes, that walks through locked doors. Um, lots, have been, lots of things have been debated about this as well. Now, the Reformed churches teach that Jesus is omnipresent outside his human body because it doesn't make any sense for a physical body to be somehow omnipresent or to walk through locked doors. Um, but to have Jesus separated from his physical body is just as difficult to understand as what we teach that Jesus is omnipresent in his body. Both of them don't make any sense to us, to human, to human reason. Um, but the problem with the reformed idea is that it introduces a separation uh, between div Jesus divine and human natures, as if his human nature is not omnipresent, but his divine nature is. And uh, one of the ancient heresies of the church is a division between the two natures, as if Jesus person were simply a divine and human nature glued together like two boards that could be separated. And um, that, that uh, was a heresy denied in one of the first church councils. Um, Jesus is a single person. The divine and um, human natures can't be separated any longer. And so Jesus, the person, is omnipresent. And we don't know how that works uh, any more than to say he's separated and omnipresent. And so, uh, so we just have to leave it we just have to leave it at that. That's a question probably that we can't answer. Uh, then here at the end, I mentioned this already, uh, when we looked at the structure of the narrative, they described what had happened. Um, and we get a little nervous about talking about personal testimony, but it's really the only way to talk to anybody. Uh, you can leave a Bible in a hotel room. Um, how many of you think that that's super effective? I don't, I don't think that's probably, uh, I think it's good, right? But I don't think it's the most effective thing you can do as a disciple of Jesus. Uh, the most effective thing you can do is to tell somebody else your story, your personal testimony. Uh, it's really the only way. Uh, maybe it's because we have so many of Paul's letters that we think we should probably talk like Paul does um, with lots of Old Testament allusions, with lots of uh, logic and argumentation and things. Um, the problem is, of course, that Paul was super brilliant and inspired, and we aren't. Uh, and so our own personal testimony is, is much more effective. Um, 
I wrote, I, we did a Bible study on evangelism sometime last fall, and then I wrote a little blog post um, on our website about how to construct a personal testimony, like what are the parts of that to make an effective one. Uh, so you can find that, you can read that on our, on our website. On the homepage, you'll find the pastor's blog, and then there's a tag on the side. Uh, you can find missions uh, as a tag on the side, and you'll see, um, there's only a couple of things tagged that. You'll see a, that blog post in there. How do I share Jesus with my friends or something like that it's called, but, uh, but you'll find that there. Okay, so that's just a couple of the uh, interesting things I found along the way um, as we go. You know, the Zoom format is just a lot of me talking, and then you'll finally get a chance to do your talking. If we were in person, we would have stopped along the way after each slide and, and just heard what people had to say. But, um, but we've still got a chance to uh, do that a little bit, um, a little bit now. So let's see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, Jamie and Ladonna. First, hi everybody. Um, I was just gonna make a comment and a couple of things, and these are all just my opinion based on what I read, but. I think it's kind of funny how people haven't changed. You know, we sometimes, I, I guess myself, sometimes think, oh, these are such different people. But there's so much sarcasm in their first comment to Jesus where they say, basically like one of our friends saying like, where have you been? You know, <laughs> how come, you know, when you say, so what's going on with this? And they're like, well, where have you been? You know, and so I find that kind of funny. And then um, the next part was when, they, when he talks about, he explained, you know, scriptures from Moses concerning him. Um, I, I think, and, and it's kind of a reiteration of what you said, Pastor, I think that we're not told exactly what he said because it's not necessary because we have the scriptures. And, and that's what God wants us to look at. He doesn't want us to get the four-hour version. He wants us to read through all of his word and to study it continually. And so um, I think that that's, that's what we need to take out of it is that we need to be in his word. Yeah, certainly they're talking about Moses and the scriptures, uh, the prophets, the Old Testament, right? We've got a New Testament where much of that is explained to us as well. So we've already got more resources than they have. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Uh, a chat uh, question, Joe and Nadia. All right. Wait, can you hear me? Cool. Uh, I like what you said about the personal testimony because we always freak out about that. But that's like sales 101. Like you got to relate to the person, right? Through like a personal story. So I think it's, I think it's okay. Not that we're trying to sell something or, you know, but I think that's, that's important. So I like that you said that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the, the, the technique for um, that sort of testimony is that we are going to um, uh, identify our own story, right? Like um, uh, last week I, st I talked about, well, sometime recently I talked about, I don't remember, uh, the before, the turn, and the after, right? And you're thinking about your own story like that. Uh, what was I like before I knew Jesus? And it didn't, how, how did it not work out for me? And what should I do now? Uh, now that now that um, something is different, how are things? Uh, I was going to see if I could just find that. I'm going to have to look at my own post here. I can find it. What's your problem? How has Jesus solved that problem? And then what's new? Right. That's your that's your personal testimony. Um, that's the sermon structure very often as well in generic terms rather than detailed terms, right? Um, and so we are knowing that story. Who, who are you? What drives you? What's your mission in life? Uh, what happy ending are you looking for? And how are you not getting that? How is your mission unachievable? How is your happy ending not happening? Uh, why is Jesus the reason for the hope that you have? And then how is Jesus, how is life with Jesus better? than life without, right? So in the blog post, I, I, I shared mine, um, my own story. And I, I would say it like this. Um, I'm a perfectionist. Uh, that's kind of who I am, my mission in life, uh, to get things done just right in order. Many of you know this about me, right, already. Um, but the struggle that I have with that is that I want other people to be perfectionists too. And you can imagine how that goes in life, in my own house, right? 
uh, there are certainly going to be challenges there. And so uh, my personality then finds uh, a struggle that way uh, as I'm trying to control other people is how it really ends up, right? I try to fix everything for everybody else and then get frustrated when other people don't recognize my solution as the best one, right? Uh, and, and even if that's not your story, that's personal. Um, and you can relate to that, right? Now, here's the brilliant part about a personal testimony. Um, nobody can argue with it, right? Now, at that point, you've told somebody a little bit about you. You've opened up. You've shared something about you. They'll say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's funny. I get that. I know that works. But then you say, look, this is how my faith helps me. My faith helps me because I know nothing is perfect in this world right? It can never be. My theology tells me things, that things can never be perfect. The people and the stuff in this world are never going to be uh, 100%. Uh, everything has a bug in the system that I can't fix, that I can't do anything about. Uh, so my fervent hope is that Jesus makes things perfect for me, right? That that's how he, uh, uh, that's how he will help me. Now, it's not going to happen today, this week at my house, uh, but that's my hope. That's my promise, is that someday things will be perfect, right? It's great. And so what I know now as a Christian is that it's not my job to do his job. Uh, my job is to get through life as calmly as possible, to help people along the way when I can, but to know that um, the inefficiencies and the imperfections of life uh, are only there to serve, to remind me of where I want to go, to keep my eyes fixed on heaven, right? And so um, that's what Jesus does for me. And nobody can argue with that, pure personal testimony. Nobody can say that isn't true, you know. Uh, and in our postmodern culture, the complaint often is that uh, all these young people don't believe in anything like absolute truth. So what? It's actually not a problem. Um, actually, Christians have the answer to real questions that people have. What's my meaning in life? Where am I going? Why doesn't this work? These um, meta-narrative, metaphysical questions. Uh, it's not about creation and evolution. It's not about um, many of these other issues. We're, uh, that's not what people are interested in. And it's not the ultimate questions that we're having to deal with. The Bible is not a story about creation versus evolution. The Bible is a story about Jesus and how he changes you and saves you and offers you hope for a future. Um, so I wasn't going to go through all of that, but thanks, Joe. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, that's the whole story, um, uh, the whole story of the Bible. And, and I think it's effective that way. And that's really what these disciples did. You know, when they ran back to Jerusalem, they said, we had a problem. Jesus appeared to us. Now we have hope. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what else? You can chat as well if you don't want to talk. <laughs> I just happen to have a couple people that I can see in the little thumbnail strip. And I'm, I'm just waiting because I'm guessing that they are both trying to raise a hand or, yep, yeah, okay. There you go, Alan, and then you got to click unmute. You got it. So as we're talking about that little phrase, it's such a small phrase, but that, you know, the disciples saying, stay with us. And I know there's a lot written about it. Um, you know, you talked about Jesus pretending to go on, but I think throughout Scripture, there's these moments in time where God gives his followers uh, at, an opportunity to respond to his goodness. And I know they didn't recognize who Jesus was at this point, but this person who they didn't recognize shares, you know, all of scripture with them and they want to respond by saying, stay with us longer. And I think of other times, you know, Peter at the transfiguration is like, let's just stay here. I've seen something amazing. Let's just stay put for a while. And I just think that that is part of the Christian walk too. And you talked about like giving their testimony that, you know, we've been so blessed for me my whole life. I don't ever remember not, you know, being baptized as an infant. I don't ever remember not being in church. 
but then how often do we take opportunities to respond to what we've been given? And so I just think here's an opportunity that the disciples, first of all, want to show their appreciation for this person who shared scripture with them. And then when they found out it was the Lord, again, they had a second opportunity to respond to God's goodness by running back and telling the other disciples. So I just think if we, as we think about all our opportunities to serve at King of Grace or in our community or to our fellow neighbor, that God gives us these opportunities to respond to his goodness. And it's a blessing that he gives us, that, that us sinful people, that we can find ways to serve him by serving one another. And I just think that's part of the, the Christian walk, too, is recognizing how God's bless us, blessing us and then looking for those opportunities that he gives us to show our love and appreciation for all that he's done for us. And I see that in this story. So that was my comment. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, there, there's a, a theme of hospitality in the scriptures, and I think that's an, uh, an important thing to recognize. You can trace that through uh, different cultures as well, uh, a more hospitality-oriented culture than ours is today. Uh, you know, I didn't focus on that on, the, on today's sermon because um, uh, it's a sub-point, you know, not the main point. Um, but there's a, there's a lot you could say about that and a lot of people have. Um, and so these uh, disciples offer hospitality before they even know who it is, right? So think about Jesus in uh, Matthew 25 when he's talking about uh, the end of the world. And he says to those on his right, thank you for having clothed me when I was naked and having given me a drink when I was thirsty and for having visited me when I was in prison and for taking care of me when I was sick. And the people will say, when did we ever do that? And Jesus says, ah, when you've done it to one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it for me, right? Uh, and that's these disciples. Uh, this guy on the road that they don't know, they're offering hospitality for. Uh, in their case, it is actually for their king. Whereas in our case, it's for uh, another one of God's children, one of Christ's brothers and sisters. And through them, then, we offer hospitality to Jesus. Uh, now, we're just, uh, we're just organizing, maybe we're slow to this, but we're just organizing some um, uh, King of Grace coordinated relief uh, assistance help efforts for our current situation uh, with many things uh, staying at home. Uh, as we've been calling around and talking to people, there have been uh, many who have said, we'd like to offer help. And that's what's happening with these disciples, right? We have this opportunity to offer help to those who are in need. Uh, Jesus needed help when he was walking on earth, but he doesn't today. And so how do we offer help to Jesus? Is by offering help to, to those people in the world who, who live with us. Um, now, we've had many more people that want to offer help than those who are willing to admit they need help. And that's part of our cultural hangup uh, that we'd often don't want to admit when we need some help. Um, now, we instantly think about money, right? Uh, but it can be things like help getting to the grocery store and back uh, in, this, in this environment. Now, maybe there's somebody who's an at-risk health-wise uh, for the current virus. Um, and it's not that they can't go to the grocery store. It's that it's maybe not so smart for them to go to the grocery store. And maybe they could use somebody, some help, uh, somebody to drop the groceries on the front step, um, something like that. And so it's harder for us to ask for help. Uh, but Jesus' comments in Matthew 25 work the other way as well. While he's not there for us to offer assistance, uh, we can offer that assistance to others. Um, but Jesus also gave help, didn't he, very often, uh, healing people um, and uh, feeding the hungry and, and patterning for us these things, bringing his kingdom um, personally and individually. And, uh, and so Jesus still wants to help, and he's not there to do it with his own hands, so he uses the hands of the rest of us in order to help. And so when you're receiving help from other members at King of Grace, you're receiving help from Jesus. That's the flip side of that coin. And that's a beautiful thing as well. And so don't be afraid to, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Phyllis, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. You can? Yes. Okay, um, you, 
it's very hard when you were talking about perfectionism that's really hard to admit that you're a perfectionist because most perfectionists don't think they are perfectionists because we can never be perfect and we can never do it well enough nor can our people do it well enough and so that's a real challenge to admit that there's perfectionism because there is no such thing in the world you know and we try real hard but we can never achieve that just because of what we are that we're human sinners yeah <laughs> so that i thought was very brave even well though you can be recognized as a perfectionist <laughs> <laughs> but the one in, the person themselves it's tough to be a perfectionist yeah 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 so as a pastor what you've asked me to do is to spend my time uh studying a text like i have done here uh so that i can share with you insights and things that i learned about it but you've also asked me to model that for you uh right and so i've had practice admitting uh self-examining right and admitting that sort of thing is what we should all do uh, is hard um and i'm not saying it's easy for me as well but uh you know what you've asked me to do is is to be brave and to do that so yep there you we go. appreciate it <laughs> okay what else uh any other uh questions or observations eugene you'll have to click unmute there Okay, you can hear me now, right? Yep. Uh, regarding Phyllis's comment, I just wanted to expand on that and say another message that we listened to earlier this morning spoke to the statement that in the world we celebrate and consider beautiful our our brokenness and our our you know you know our secular um, society celebrates that which is imperfect and that in actuality we celebrate christ who is perfect not our own imperfection but rather that we are made perfect in christ and that's what's beautiful now i don't know if i restated that exactly right but that's basically how i remember it and we don't see that in the world what what stuck with me is how the world celebrates all of the things that are wrong with us it, they call it our diversity and um i'm not talking about our different ethnicities or anything that you know all of our all of the different genders for example and and those things that are imperfect the world wants us to lift up as being perfect and in actuality it's in that imperfection that we should see christ and his perfection yeah thank you Any last things? All right, well, uh, we'll close with prayer. I'll put down the screen here and then you can uh, continue to visit and uh, use this time a little bit if you wanna chat with anybody else that you see on here as well. But um, it's been great to uh, have a chance to share some of the extra things. You know, uh, doing all of the study during the week and then writing a sermon means cut, 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 cut. Uh, to get down to the main point, right? So there's lots of things that end up on the editing room floor. And uh, this is a, an opportunity to um, share some of those extra things as well. So I enjoy it. I appreciate it. And I'm glad to see, uh, glad to see you here again this week. So uh, let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, you have given us all Holy Scripture for our learning and for our understanding, and you have revealed to us, Jesus, throughout the pages of history and of your book, uh, that all things are organized by you to accomplish our salvation. Now, we know at times we uh, don't do a good job of walking with Jesus, of paying attention to your word, of asking for explanation, of learning from our teachers, um, but we thank you for having given us um, all these people in our lives who can do this for us. We ask that you would send us your Holy Spirit to uh, encourage us to have our 
uh, teachers um, with us, that we can ask questions, that we can continue to grow in our journey of learning. Thank you for giving your son to stay with us uh, all the way through our journey here on earth. Um, help us to be strong in the faith until we reach the end of that journey and enjoy an eternity of blessings with you and the eternal uh, Lord's Supper in your presence. Amen. Okay.